Okay, welcome back. This is the third and last part of my lectures on the biophysics of tissues. So we started in the first lecture with the mechanics of networks, vertex models, um, and compartment boundaries. In the next second lecture, I discussed um, chemical patterns and signals in particular. Like this? Better? Let's hope so, yeah? I'm not sure I can regulate the volume, but. OK. And um, today, I will talk about how tissue shape emerges. And I will discuss again the example of the uh, fly wing development. And in particular, I will discuss how many cellular events and processes in this tissue contribute together to change the shape and to deform the tissue. And um, so here you see the characteristic adult fly wing, which we've been showing already a few times. You've seen it also in other talks. Um, it has this characteristic shape, a characteristic vein pattern. And for comparison, I show you below the shape of the wing of a fly that is mutant in the single gene called dumpy. And this mutation causes an abnormally misformed wing, a misformed wing. There are different versions of this dumpy mutant. The knockout of this gene is lethal. And sort of mutations of various degree give um, um, gradually stronger misformations of, of the wing. So um, one of the points of this lecture will be to understand what is the difference between these two flies and how uh, do they come out to look different in terms of their wing shape. I already showed you that we study the tissue morphogenesis during pupil stages in the living system. One can watch the tissue by opening up the pupil case and directly looking at it through the microscope inside the pupa. And I also already showed you this time-lapse movie, 17 hours of pupil wing development. This is the tissue that will give rise to the wing. The e caterin staining reveals as a fluorescent label the outlines of cells. And uh, so you also maybe see roughly that this image, this movie is stitched together from many individual images. You see these lines which come from stitching. So there are many sort of high resolution microscope images stitched together to create a large scale image. And each frame that is generated um, uh, is separated from the next by about five minutes. And now we go through about 17 hours of development and we see these dramatic um, dynamics, many cellular events, cell division, cell rearrangements, giving rise to cell, cell flows, um, structures form, the morpho morphology of veins emerges. And you can also see that the boundary of the tissue moves. It is reshaped and undergoes shear deformations. And at the end, you see already the morphology of an adult fly wing emerging in this process. So what I'm going to discuss today is sort of some of the aspects of this process. In particular, I'd like to ask how large-scale tissue deformations emerge from these many individual cellular events. Um, I'd also like to sort of get some understanding of what is the mechanics that analyze these flows and this tissue remodeling. What are the force balances involved? What drives this? And having sort of answers to these questions, we'd like to then sort of get some insight in how do these dumpy mutants have a deformed shape. And uh, let's first, sort of before going into this, give you sort of a large scale um, view because it's helpful to think about the problem. I showed this already yesterday. Um, so here I recolor the region of the tissue which will become the wing hinge and the region of the tissue which will become the wing blade differently. And you see here that there is an overall contraction of the wing hinge, which is 
an important driver of these deformations, it sort of pulls on the wing blade. Um, and this happens in a context of this tissue being inside a cuticle. The cuticle is sort of a, is a material that was secreted earlier by these cells. It solidifies, and the tissue can hold on to the cuticle while it undergoes this remodeling. So therefore, I schematically show this here as attachments to the cuticle. In fact, they are all around they, they, they do exist. And the tissue is sort of being stretched while being attached to a rigid scaffold. So the simple picture is that the hinge contracts while at the outside the tissue is attached. And so the tissue can stretch itself and therefore pull on it, even though the boundary doesn't move, by contracting the hinge area. So it's a mechanical event by which the tissue stretches. There are external forces pulling, but they are generated inside the tissue by contracting it while it holds on to the boundary. And as a result, the tissue, particularly I will focus on the wing blade, is undergoing a shear deformation. And from the point of view of the wing blade, it looks like as if there was a force pulling on it from the outside. Um, now, the fact that there are these attachments and that they are important uh, for this tissue morpho morphogenesis, one can show and is revealed in experiments where one uses laser ablation at the tissue margins without sort of um, um, affecting the tissue itself, but cutting material that connects the tissue with the cuticle. And here you see um, an experiment, an image taken at 32 hours after puparium formation, when earlier, at the time point 22 hours after preparing formation, a laser cut was performed along this blue line. And as a result, um, these connections are lost and the tissue is pulled in. Similarly, cutting on one side, at 22 hours the tissue moves in this side. Here the connections are still there and the tissue does not move in. So one can see evidence for these connections. And we have to take these into account when we want to understand uh, this process. Okay, so this is a large-scale picture, just to keep you sort of this as a background when we discuss now about what's going on inside the tissue. Now, to understand um, the processes taking place inside the tissue, we are interested in the celloid events, cell shape, cell shape changes, cell rearrangements. And to study that, between the tissue and the, and the, and the cuticle, it's an extracellular matrix. And the dumpy protein is there as well. Mm. Um, so we use automated image analysis to segment these images and to determine the cell outlines as polygonal uh, contours for all the cells in all the frames. And here you see the segmentation for the initial frame. And this is sort of the time dependence of the segmented um, network of cells. So this shows we have a database with all the cells, their shapes, and we track them over time. We track divisions, track extrusions, and we can uh, follow cell rearrangements. Um, I mentioned before that the uh, images are of very high resolution, and uh, I can just highlight that by zooming into one of these images. And you see here the fluorescence intensity and the polygons that are determined from the segmentation. And we can, for each cell, choose a unique label to follow cells in time. And these numbers are these cell labels. So each cell has a, has a unique identifier. And if one now goes from one frame to the next, one can track these cells. And we can follow cellular events taking place, for example, many, many cell divisions. For example, this cell becomes larger here, and it is about to divide into two daughter cells. So between this frame and the next frame, this division has happened, and we can now assign two new cell labels to these two daughter cells, and we can, of course, remember which um, cell they originated from. So we have a database with all this information, and all the polygonal vertex positions and their network connections. Now, to do uh, an analysis of 
deformations that are generated by all these events, um, we start from this polygonal network um, measured in this tissue, and we construct a conjugate triangular network. And it will become clear in a moment why that is useful. So we have a set of polygons. We can define cell centers as the geometric centers of each polygon. And now we define using the cell centers for each vertex, we can construct a triangle shown here. And this triangular network that also fills space, it contains the same topological and shape information as the original polygonal network, it's the conjugate network. Um, for example, you see that for each cell bond of the original polygon, each edge of a polygon becomes an edge of a triangle, but perpendicular to the original polygon network. Um, each vertex in the original polygon network corresponds to a triangle in the new network. Yeah. And um, each polygon corresponds to a new vertex in the triangle network. So the, in the view of what I discussed in my first lecture about the Euler characteristics, the vertices are exchanged by faces, and we get a corresponding network, which of course has the same the number of E is the same. The vertices are turned into, into faces, and the faces are turned into vertices, and we have a conjugate that is the same Euler characteristic. Um, now we have two networks, polygons and triangles. I will mainly now discuss the triangular network. But one can use many of the, of the, of the, of the quantities I'm discussing. We can equally uh, well define for, for polygons. And let's start with a definition of how we want to quantify deformations in these networks. And the definition of a tissue deformation tensor, it's a tensorial object, is motivated by continuum mechanics, where deformations are defined as displacement gradients. So I can define for each cell a displacement field, a displacement vector, which then forms a displacement field in this material. So for, this is a vector. Alpha is a vector index. I'm a, I'm a plane, so everything's two-dimensional. Alpha is equals x or y. But a displacement is not a deformation, because if you just have constant displacement, you just move the tissue, the material around. Displacement happens when distances change. And that happens whenever the displacement varies in space. And that's why a deformation is a displacement gradient. And since the displacement is a vector, the displacement gradient is a tensor. It's a matrix if you represent it. Now, in order to define this idea for a meshwork of polygons or of triangles, um, we use a very general approach. Um, if you have a continuum displacement gradient defined, and you average this over an arbitrary region in space, arbitrary patch of area, so an integrated over area and divide by the total area to average it, then this can be exactly expressed, because this is an integral over a derivative, depends only on the boundary, in a boundary integral around this patch. And I have now a boundary integral around the boundary line of this patch. dl is a line element. n is the normal vector to the boundary line. And u is now the displacement vector on this boundary. So if I integrate the displacement vector multiplied with a normal vector, generating a tensorial object around the boundary, I can calculate this average deformation. And this is sort of a coarse-grained deformation um, tensor uh, corresponding to this patch. And now I can apply this definition to arbitrary patches. I can apply it to a region of the tissue, but I can also apply it to a single polygon or to a single triangle. So if I take, for example, a single triangle, and I move these vertices, then I will move this boundary line. And then I can perform this integral around the edges of the triangle using the deformation of the boundary line and defining the displacement, sorry, the deformation tensor for this triangle. If I do that for each triangle individually, of course, I'm not going to get a displacement. I have to take one frame of my movie and I look for the same triangle in the subsequent frame. And as these triangles change, this defines me 
this object and this, this plans, defines me the tensor describing triangle deformation. If I do this for every triangle in the network, I can do also do this for polygons. So this here I don't need to distinguish between triangles or general polygons. Um, then this has the nice property that if I average over triangles in a certain patch of the tissue, this integral becomes exactly the sum over the quantities of the triangles. If I ever, if I weigh it with the areas of triangles, so the quantity calculated for a large patch or even for the whole wing, for the whole tissue, only using deformations at the boundary, are exactly given by the sum over properties of deformations of individual triangles. And that's, a, that's a very powerful property of this definition. And this definition has the property that it corresponds exactly to the continuum mechanical concept of displacement gradient tensor. And that's, that's important to, to understand, to see what, what we are doing here. Now, this allows us now to calculate u alpha beta for all triangles and also for all groups of triangles, including the whole tissue, in our movies. Now, u alpha beta is a matrix, as I mentioned. It has four components. And this matrix can be uniquely decomposed into contributions that have a precise physical meaning. And uh, this is schematically shown here. One can de decompose this matrix, which is a general non-symmetric matrix. It's the gradient of a, of a vector. In a matrix that is symmetric and traceless, traceless means that the sum of the diagonal elements is 0. And a symmetric traceless matrix of, of a deformation gradient is a pure shear deformation. If one only looks at the diagonal elements and their sum, that's the so-called trace of the matrix, um, this defines area changes, corresponds to area changes, expansion or compression of the, of the area. And finally, one can extract an anti-symmetric part of the matrix. That's sort of what, if I take the symmetric part here, what remains is the anti-symmetric part. Um, that is associated with pure rotations. So we maybe just use a blackboard to, to illustrate this a little bit because the notation will be used later again. So when I write u alpha beta, I mean by that a matrix which has in two dimensions four components. Alpha and beta can both be x or y, so x, x, u, x, y, u, y, x, <laughs> U, Y, Y. Now, first, I can decompose this matrix in a symmetric part and an anti-symmetric part. Now, the diagonal elements, so symmetric means that this is the same as this. The diagonal is always symmetric. So what I do is I write U, that doesn't change, and I symmetrize it here. U, X, Y plus U, Y, X over 2. U, X, Y plus u, y, x over 2, u, y, y. And so this is not the same. I have to add something. And what I have to add is purely anti-symmetric. So this is now 0, um, u, um, x, y, minus u, y, x over 2, and u, um, y, x minus u x, y over 2, 0. And this is minus this, so it's anti-symmetric. And um, now this I can write as a number, u, x, y minus u, y, x over 2, times a purely anti-symmetric matrix. So I plus 1, minus 1, 0. And this matrix I will always call epsilon, alpha, beta in my, my talk. Yeah. And this symmetric matrix, I can also decompose. So I call this, this matrix, I will, this is the symmetric part of U alpha beta. I call it US. And this I can decompose US XX, US XY. Because it's symmetric, these two elements are the same. I give this the same name, US XY. 
USYY. These are can decompose into a traceless part and a part only corresponding to the trace. The traceless part has the form UX x symmetric minus u, sorry, y, y symmetric. Then I have here u, x, y, um, u, x, y. So this is just symmetric. It's a traceless symmetric matrix. And here I have um, u, y, y symmetric minus u, x, x symmetric over 2. And now I have to add the part coming from the trace. Um, that is u x x symmetric plus u y y. So remember, the sum of the diagonal elements u x x and u y y is the trace. And I multiply this with one the unit matrix. And this, in my notation, I will always call delta alpha beta. So that's the name of this matrix. That's the name of this matrix. And now you can see all these things happening. Uh, yes, I think it's fixed. So maybe I have to move it. I have to write it up. Yeah. So, yeah. so you can't see it here. Yeah? So I said delta alpha beta is the matrix one one zero zero, which I use here. And this matrix here, yeah, you don't see it, but this is what I call U tilde. This is a traceless symmetric part of U. So this is now divided in. So this is subdivided in these two. This is u tilde that you see here. <laughs> then this part here, the trace, is this term here with a delta alpha beta corresponding to this. And this piece here is exactly this term, which is epsilon times a number, which I call psi. Yeah. And um, so here I just perform, perform exactly this decomposition. And I call u tilde the traceless symmetric part, which is this one. This turns out to be the divergence of the displacement field because, um, I'll just write this out for you, because the displacement field is u alpha. If I take d beta u alpha and take the trace of that, then this is d gamma u gamma by sum over gamma, and this is the divergence of u, the vector u. And this, this is just u x x plus u y y. This gives this term. And psi is equal to u x y minus u y x over 2. And that's the angle of rotation that corresponds to this deformation. Now this one can do now for each frame in the movie, for each polygon, for each triangle and um, defines now local shear deformations, local compression and expansion, local rotations. I'd like to stress that the tensor u tilde alpha beta, the traceless symmetric matrix, defines an anisotropy axis. There's no area change, there's no rotation, there's an axis. And this axis defines the axis along which the tissue, or the, the object, the polygon, the triangle, gets ex stretched. Yes? It comes from here. <clears throat> this equation again. <clears throat> so imagine you have a continuous displacement field and you can define the continuous displacement gradient. Then you can, f this is just a standard integration. If you integral, integrate the derivative, you get the boundary term. Now this is exactly equal to that. And so you can calculate this average over your displacement gradient in the area of an arbitrary area by just integrating the displacement around the boundary. Does this answer the question? It's just a question whether we can track cells or not. And there are lots of, lots of issues which will come up later. Let's, let's not worry about complications now. Yeah? 
This is just the concept. This is all well defined. Of course, in practice, there will be some issues which we'll have to discuss. Now, um, we do that for two subsequent frames and get the full deformation field, displacement field. And of course, we know the time between them, so we can translate this into velocity, velocity fields and deformation rates. Yeah. So by defining delta u, u divided by delta t gives us a velocity. I think I showed the velocity field already yesterday. Now again, we can do the same thing, but it's of course this is completely equivalent. We can decompose the, now the velocity gradient, which is the deformation rate, not the deformation, but the deformation rate, again into the similar contributions. There will be a shear rate tensor, which is traceless symmetric, there will be a divergence of the flow field, which gives me this isotropic part, which tells me about compressibility and expansion, or compression and expansion. And now there's an angle which depends on time. It's a rotation rate. It's a vorticity of a flow. And this is just sort of um, the symmetric part of the tensor. It's just symmetrized, as I explained. The vorticity is the anti-symmetric part, and so on. Yeah. Okay, so that's... Um, a discussion of deformations. And for these deformations and deformation rates, we need to at least have two subsequent movie frames to define and measure them. So they talk about changes from one frame to the next. The next important quantity that I want to introduce, and that's the point where the triangulation becomes relevant, is our state quantities. These are quantities which describe shapes, and they have the property that one can define them for a given shape, for a given movie frame. So for each movie, we can define shapes of all the triangles, and also similarly to, uh, of the polygons. And uh, that's a state quantity. That's very important to remember for what comes, comes later. And the idea is the following. For each triangle, I want to find a measure of its shape which is unique, that I know, if I know this measure, I know exactly what the shape of the triangle is. Um, and I do that by using formally, abstractly, a reference triangle and ask, how do I have to transform the reference triangle to get my specific shape? And I associate to the shape measure this transformation. And the transformation is a matrix, S alpha beta. And the reference triangle is sort of the most unbiased triangle I can come up with. It's an is an um, equilateral triangle. And for the moment, I'm only talking about, sh about shape, not about size. So let's not worry about how big these triangles are. Let's, let's take triangles which keep their area constant in the transformation. And let me sketch this on the blackboard. So I start from a reference triangle, which is equilateral, and which has these side vectors, which I call R1 and R2. And then there's also a vector R3, which is essentially given by the other two, which is R1 minus R2. And now I have an arbitrary triangle, which, which is completely, I can, any, any possible triangle I can choose, has now vector R1, sorry, R2 prime and R1 prime. And the matrix is defined such that the vector Ri can be written as S matrix, so this is now a coordinate independent notation of vectors and matrices. Um, this is prime and this is Ri. So for all the three sides, I have a unique matrix which transforms these vectors into those vectors. And of course, if it works for R1 and R2, it trivially also works for R3. And this can be done uniquely only for triangles. That's why I'm using a triangulation. If you have more sides than, than three, there's not a unique solution to that. It will not work. But for triangles, I can define for each arbitrary triangle exactly one matrix S. There's a one um, small issue here that is, um, this is up to rotations. So if I want to have the same triangle, but not only rotate it, I have to rotate my reference triangle to get that. And what that means in the end is that I need two things. I need and it's a quantity which I call triangle elongation. That's a measure of the shape of the triangle. Only shape, not position, not rotation. But also an angle theta, which tells me how this shape is now oriented in space. 
And this is done the following way. I can uniquely, again, decompose this matrix S, which I identify just from the geometry of triangles, in a product of two matrices. A pure rotation matrix. It does nothing else than rotate things. And an exponential of a matrix Q. Now, since both matrices shouldn't change the area, they have to have determinant 1. This is tr obviously true for rotation matrix, because rotations don't change areas. They have determinant 1. It is only true for the exponent of Q if Q has, um, is traceless. Yeah, because for um, the exponent of a matrix is defined by the, by a, by the Taylor expansion, 1 plus Q plus Q squared over 2 and higher orders. Yeah? And we have the determinant of e to the Q is e to the trace of Q. Yeah? So if the trace is 0, the determinant is 1. So that's why we have here an traceless symmetric matrix, similar to what we had in the shear deformation tensor. But it's, there's some vague similarity, but it's not the same thing. That's why we have to distinguish it. Um, this is a traceless symmetric tensor. And I can uniquely decompose S in these two things. So for each triangle, I can now calculate Q, defining an axis and a stretch that I have to apply to an equilateral reference to generate my triangle, and an orientation. That's the orientation of the original reference triangle to which I apply the, uh, the, 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 the stretching. That is why I first the rotation, then the stretching. Now, of course, I can, yes. Yes. You can count, if you, if you do that in practice, it's a simple exercise. You can show that it's unique. Not, not hard to see. You count degrees of freedom. It's exactly matches. matches. For the moment, I'm discussing only shape changes, not area changes. Next slide is area changes. So now, now I have this. Now I can add area changes to it. And of course, since this doesn't change area, I put all the area changes in one factor. Very easy. So A0 is the reference area, and A is the actual area of a triangle, and I just have to add this factor. The areas will be sort of trivial in the whole discussion. So now I have, for my triangulation, I can define this now for every individual triangle. It's a perfectly unique definition. It gives me a field of Q tensors and a field of orientation angles. <clears throat> and I'd like to stick to the triangle representation because everything is exact here. I don't have to, because this works so well here. And I can, can still go to the cell level by, for example, defining the tensor Q describing the shape of a cell by simply averaging the, the Qs of the triangles that, share this, that are shared by the cell. That's not exactly, but I think that's a perfectly valid definition of the Q tensor for, for this polygon. Because for polygons, this is not, not, there's no unique definition of the sense to do it. So let's use this definition as a definition for the polygons. There's no Voronoi diagram here. It's not Voronoi. Um, it's not very far, very different from Voronoi. It's not the same thing. So I don't want to talk about Voronoi diagrams here. Yeah. Um, so I can, can now define this quantity for each cell. And it is a measure of how anisotropic the shape of the cell is. I can identify this as a traceless symmetric tensor, which, as I said, defines an axis and strength of an axis. So I could use a red bar. If it, becomes, if it becomes long, there's more anisotropy. If it's short, it's less anisotropy. And the, the axis is defined by the orientation of the bar. Now, to show what happens in the tissue in terms of this quantity, I average this Q tensor over small patches of cell, so of course drain it, and show you the pattern of these red bars in the tissue during this movie. So here we start. They are all quite small. The cells are almost isotropic. They are oriented in all sorts of directions. There's no, no order. But as the tissue now undergoes these dramatic rearrangements and it's being put under external stress, there is a pattern emerging of a large-scale coordination of cell elongation. 
you see that the, it, it goes, grows up, becomes very strong, and then it relaxes again, which will be quite remarkable. So show this again. So that is how the cell shapes averaged over regions um, evolves in time, and it exhibits this extraordinary large-scale uh, order, which is revealed by this analysis. The number of cells changes a lot because they all the numbers of them divide. I, I think I said that before. Yes, but there is no growth. The cells divide, but it gets smaller. You're talking about the veins. The, the veins are determined by genetic patterns. And the cells in the veins have a slightly different behavior from the cells outside. I will not talk about this here. We're still working on that. But the cells essentially become smaller. And the rearrangements in the veins are slightly different than outside. In my talk today, I will just average over the whole thing without worrying about the internal structure so much. And you see also that this elongation pattern is not really perturbed by the veins. The veins go at an angle through it. OK, now comes another important um, concept where I would just like to spend a little bit of time um, and go into some of the mathematics because it's so elementary and sort of very general for, I think, for all tissues. There is now a fundamental relationship between the state variables that I introduced, this defining anisotropies of shape. I call this um, cell elongation. That's a terminology that is sometimes confusing. It means is a measure of the anisotropy of cell shape. So the fact that the shape has an elongated shape is, is implied by, by this tensor. It doesn't imply an actual elongation at which it is deformed. No. The deform so that we have to distinguish state variables, which is the shape, Q, and orientation theta, and deformation variables, which are introduced as U, which describes how I go from one triangle to the next triangle, in, from one frame to the next. So I can have an initial frame. I know what the shape of the triangles is. They go to the second frame. They have new shapes. The same triangles have new shapes. And now I can ask, if I know what the initial and final state variables are, do I know what the deformation is that happened in between? And these are different quanti quantities. So I like to relate now. Given initial and final state properties, which I've measured in, in my frames, without knowing what the next frame will be, can I determine? The, the change, the deformation from these state variables. So the idea is I have a reference triangle for all states. I use my transformation with q and theta to define the initial triangle. I use the new variables q prime and theta prime to define the, the late triangle. I have difference in, in q. Delta q is q prime minus q. I have difference in, in, in orientation angle of the reference theta prime minus theta. I have difference in area, A prime minus A. And now, what is the relationship between these changes and the actual deformation, delta U, that I defined in my first slide, which can be decomposed in pure shear, in pure rotation, and pure area change. Now, the area change is simple. What I have, have, will have here is just delta A over A. That's easy to show. What is harder to do is to understand what these two things are. And uh, this is just an exercise in, in calculating the shape, the formation of a triangle. It's not, nothing special, but it's surprisingly subtle what happens there. So I, I show you what the result is if you do this calculation. So I calculate first the traceless symmetric part of this deformation tensor. And it expresses in terms of the initial Q matrix and its change. So here's the Q matrix, here's its change. Also in terms of the change of the angle theta of the reference triangle orientation. And I parameterize the Q tensor as a magnitude Q times a matrix that has only an orientation. And theta is, defines the, the angle of the axis along which Q describes um, an, an elongated shape. So theta is a property of the tensor Q, an angle. The Q is the magnitude of this anisotropy, which one can calculate from the trace of Q squared. So this is the matrix multiplied by itself and then taking the diagonal sum. And so this matrix can uniquely be written as this. And now if this angle phi changes, 
I get a contribution here. Now this epsilon here is my anti-symmetric matrix which I introduced on the blackboard. This is the original tensor. And this is a complicated relationship. It has become simple in certain cases. It becomes simple when there are no rotations involved. So if the initial reference triangle and the final reference triangle are not rotated, and if under this, deformation, this change of Q, the axis of Q does not rotate, that becomes very simple, because then um, delta theta is 0 and delta phi is 0. No rotation. Now, this whole part disappears. And we, in this special case, we see that the shear deformation is exactly given by the change in Q. And that's why the introduction of this quantity Q is so useful and so important. Q is a state variable. And if I only know its change, I know the actual deformation that happens. So changes of Q are actual deformations if there are no rotations involved. If there are rotations, it gets more complicated. And you can also immediately understand why it gets more complicated if there are rotations. Because if you take a triangle and you simply rotate it, there, um, there is no deformation. But my Q tensor changes because first it had an elongation along a stretched shape along one axis and later has a stretched shape along another axis. So if we have a pure rotation of a triangle, delta U is zero and cannot be the same as delta Q. And this term corrects for that. So if we have a pure rotation, delta theta equals delta phi. The Q rotates exactly the same way as the reference triangle. The Gs here drop out, which are the complicated function of sinus hyperbolic of, of this magnitude Q. They drop out, G minus G. The one remains, and this is just a co-rotational term, which exactly corrects and delta Q takes out the rotation. And this is zero. Now, in general, this is more, more complicated. If we, so if we have a stretch without rotation, it's simple. If we have a pure, pure rotation, it's simple. If we have something in between, it's complicated. The sec second thing we can discuss is um, the rotation. So that psi is the actual rotational component of the displacement gradient. And this psi can also be calculated in terms of my qualities. If we have um, a pure rotation, then we see that psi is just the rotation angle, because those two are the same and it's dropped out. If we don't have a pure rotation, that's a complicated case, then delta psi is different from the rotation angle. And um, now, Usually, I'm trying to talk about, not about deformations, but about deformations rates, because things evolve in time. And then I have to develop these quantities, and I'll not look at, at infinitesimal changes u. I will divide it by the delta t that corresponds, and I will define a velocity gradient, so a deformation rate. And then this becomes, in fact, the shear rate of the, of the, of the system. V tilde alpha beta is the velocity gradient, symmetric, traceless. It's a pure shear deformation rate. This becomes the time dependence of the Q tensor, dQ dt. And this here becomes a correction term that has all the time derivatives in it. And such a time derivative, such an expression is in general terms called a corotational time derivative. Because this is a pure time derivative, and this takes out rotations. And in fact, this V it can be written as a time derivative of Q taken in a reference frame that rotates with the system at a particular rate, and the particular rate is complicated. So I therefore express V as a time derivative, and the capital D denotes a co-rotational, a sort of time derivative with a complicated definition, a co-rotational time derivative. And one way to write it is shown here. I use it in terms of my continuum variable description system. Now, with sort of continuum theory, I have a velocity gradient, which can be written as a co-rotational time derivative of the Q field in the tissue. This, this co-rotational time derivative is defined as the um, simple derivative. In fact, since I'm tracking triangles in a continuum theory language, it corresponds to a convected time derivative. And this is a co-rotational term. Um, omega is the actual vorticity in the tissue, which I defined before. And d phi dt has to do with the actual change of orientation angle of the tensor 
Now, this looks a bit unintuitive. This is just geometry of triangles, and nothing there here. But it's surprisingly subtle, and it's important for, to understand material deformations. So to give you sort of a hint at what this equation actually describes, um, I show you a simple example where rather than looking at the triangle, which is difficult to see what's going on, I show you a pattern. You can imagine there is some sort of a very fine-grained triangulation of the plane, and some of the triangle bonds are black, and some of them are, are white, so that you see a pattern. You know? And now I, I let this pattern undergo deformations. And I, of course, I, I not use, and so the equations that we are trying to understand are those here. So the, the actual vorticity of the deformation gradient can be related to reference changes, uh, rotations of reference triangles, rotations of the elongation tensor, and um, the triangle shear can be decomposed in terms of change of states of triangles. Now, I start from a circular structure where I have a pattern on it to, to, that, you, that you see its deformation and orientation. That's the Minerva, that's the symbol of the Max Planck Society. Um, so you can use the direction which it looks as a reference angle um, um, of the triangle. So if, sort of you have, you have um, equilateral reference triangles in the, in, the, in the circular state. And if we now stretch the circle to an ellipse, the triangles will be elongated. Uh, this elongation is, corresponds now to the shape of this ellipsoidal outline. Um, now, what I will do is I will apply only pure shear deformations to the system so that there's never in the deformation a um, rotational component. So delta psi is always zero. And I always, always have pure shear. I, first, I stretch it with pure shear to generate an ellipsoidal shape. Now, given this ellipsoidal shape, I stretch it in a direction at an angle to the original shape so that the axis of the elongation of the ellipse actually rotates effectively, but only because I apply a new um, stretching at an angle. And by doing that, I create a sequence of deformations. And what happens in this process, and I'll show you this in a moment, is you create actually a rotation of triangles. So the triangle reference orientation changes. Theta will change. So I, first I stretch it. Now I deform it along this axis to stretch it at a slightly, slightly different angle. Then I ch continuously change the angles. And while I do that, I never impose any rotation to the system. And but as a result, the triangles do rotate. The reference states of the triangles do rotate. And that's, that's just geometry. But it's a, it's a non-trivial aspect of combining stretching and rotations. You know? And that's what these equations describe. But it's something which in tissue can happen. Uh, cells could do this, and therefore the equations have to describe this. OK. <clears throat> so that was some mathematics. Now we have built some concepts. We have tools. We can measure lots of very interesting quantities. We understand how they're geometrically related. And now we can use that to analyze what happens in, in a tissue. And that's what I want to do in the remainder of, of, the, of this talk now. So what the important thing one has to re memorize from what I just told you in some detail is just that we measure in each frame um, quantities, tensorial quantities Q, that characterize shapes of cells and that the actual shear of, um, of these triangles can be expressed as a change of this Q tensor if it is evaluated in a co-rotating reference frame. If there are no rotations, nothing bad happens. You just, it's just the same thing. And therefore, we can write it as a co-rotational time derivative. Now, all of this is based on single triangles. And this becomes true for larger tissue patches if there are no neighbor exchanges. So if the meshwork of this triangulation doesn't change its topology, if the triangles stay all the same all the time. The next thing is to understand what happens to these relations if now we have cellular processes that change neighborship, cell divisions, T1 transitions. 
Before we get there, let me first show you the data for the flywing. So what I plot here is an average over the full wing blade. Everything is aligned along the proximal distal axis. There are no rotations if I average over the whole wing. Um, there are local rotations, but not global ones. Um, and therefore, I can ever project everything on the x-axis, and the only component that really matters is the xx component of the tensor. So I can, I can make single um, plots rather than plotting tensors, which is not so easy. So I plot here qxx, characterizing the shape of cells, and u tilde xx, characterizing the deformation of the tissue, as a function of time, average for the tissue. And you see the blue curve for uxx implies the tissue is undergoing steady shear extending along the x-axis. And the slope of this curve, of the blue curve, is the shear rate. That's vxx. So vxx is vuxx vt. So you see there is a shear rate which is more or less constant, which decreases slightly during these 17 hours. What you also see is that the cell shapes behave differently. The cell shapes start out more or less isotropic, and then they start to become elongated, also stretched along this horizontal axis. Their elongation reaches the maximum, and then they relax the elongation. Now, if this triangular network would not undergo any neighbor exchanges, divisions, and so on, these two quantities would have to be the same because of this. So the difference between those two comes from all these cellular events. So it's striking that this is not the same as the QDT. What is also very striking, and we'll come to this later, is that the slope of the green curve is steeper than the slope of the blue curve. That is very revealing, because it means that even if the cells would not rearrange, they would have to have the same slope. And usually, rearrangements lead to a case where the cells would elongate less than the overall tissue, if you have some relaxation processes. But here, the tissue is stretched, so I said, roughly as if it was pulled on it from the outside, but it's coming from the contraction of the hinge. But while the tissue is being stretched, the cells do even more of that. They stretch more. You know? This cannot come from outside. It comes from inside. So there's a very interesting information in this data. So let's now discuss this. Um, what I discussed so far was that cell shape changes can translate to deformation. And if the tissue doesn't keep sort of the neighborship relations always the same, and can directly relate tissue shape changes and tissue deformations in a similar relation as cell shape changes um, and shape deformations. So we can then write for the shear rate of the patch of tissue, by the rate at which it changes is sh the shape of the patch, as dq dt because we just average the equation over many cells. Here, the QDT is a co-rotational change of averaged elongation. Now, however, it can also change the shape of a patch of tissue without changing the shape of cells. That's only possible if cells change their neighborships. And of course, the key example is the T1 transition. I can start from a patch of cells, which has a certain shape, let's for simplicity take isotropic cell shapes here, one, two, three, four. And now I can go to this patch of cells, which has a different shape, but the cells didn't change their shape. But one and three were not neighbors before, are neighbors now. Two and four are, are no longer neighbors, but they were before. So this is a possible because we went through a T1 process, one bond shrank, we go through a fourfold junction, we rope, we open it. And this process can contribute to a shape change that is independent of the tissue, that is independent on the shape, shape change of the cell. And what it means is we can, we can decompose the overall shear rate of the tissue in the part that I explained in some detail that comes from shape changes of cells, plus a contribution that comes from rearrangements of the network. And I call this, this is a shear rate. It's a symmetric traceless tensor. And it is the contribution to shear that comes from cell rearrangements, T1 transitions. But all other events that change the topology of network can contribute to that. And um, um, cell extrusions, cell divisions, and so on. 
So now I can plot this extra term. So we have the total shear rate of the tissue, which is the blue curve, can be decomposed in the rate of change of this Q and the shear rate due to salary arrangements. So if I integrate this over time, I get this cumulative curves. And the blue curve is the green curve plus the red curve. The red curve is a contribution to shear stemming from internal meshwork rearrangements. Not so easy to do. Uh, one, one, can, one can cut it off, but it's a quite brutal. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't know enough in, in about the signals that actually contract their hinge to do the type of things. But that's, of course, uh, interesting to find out and to do. Yeah. The shapes, yeah. I'll, I'll come to that. So the, the idea is now, first, first, if I have those two curves, I can calculate the red curve just by the fact that they have to obey this sum. But in fact, one can calculate the red curve independently by looking at the individual um, changes of the, of the meshwork. And that's related, I think, to your question. In fact, we can define contributions to the red curve from the individual types of events. We can decompose this red curve, the rate of shear due to um, cell rearrangements in the part that comes purely from T1 transitions, in the part that comes purely um, from cell divisions, and the part that comes purely from cell extrusions. And all of these change the meshwork. In the case of a cell division, I add a new bond. Um, and sort of, uh, this, this leads to a retriangulation. Um, a cell extrusion leads to a retriangulation, and this leads to a retriangulation. And how to do that, I want to illustrate um, in the example of T1 transitions. So um, in this epithelium, as it, as it, as it um, evolves, cells do extrude. In the vertex model, which I showed in my first lecture, these extrusions happen in the sense that triangles can collapse. And this happens while you have a growth simulation. I counted the number of them per 100 divisions. Um, and I think in the tissue, they extrude. Now the question is, in the vertex model, they extrude for mechanical reasons. Um, and usually, so I think that they're both possible. Cells can be targeted, change their properties, which then leads to the extrusion, and then they undergo apoptosis, usually when they're outside. But they can also just be extruded for mechanical reasons and then have to decide to do apoptosis because they're no longer in, in, in the right environment. But here, this is just for, about concepts for the moment, yeah? Yeah. That what? That the... I'm not sure what the purpose is, and you, you would formulate as it was a purpose, yeah? but the model generates it. Yeah? So the mechanics can drive it. And I'm not sure if that's what you mean, but, um, <clears throat> but it can be mechanical triggering um, of, of extrusion because of the stress conditions. Yeah? Yes? It was calculated independently. Now here I explain how it is done. Um, the point is, this is an exact decomposition, so by calculating independently, it has to add up exactly. That's what it does. You know? So the way to calculate is the following. So we, we start from this configuration. We end up with this one. That's a T1 transition in between. This is the point when it happens. So the T1 transition happens at one instant. It's sort of one moment where the network has to be changed. And before the T1 transition, we have these two triangles defining uh, sort of this bond here. And after the D1 transition, we have these two triangles defining the new bond. Now, the important point is that the, this is a quadrilateral. The shape of this quadrilateral doesn't change. The only thing that's changed is this thing is flipped. You flip this bond to that bond. That's what a T1 transition does to, to the triangulation. It just flips one bond while the quadrilateral does not change. Now, before we, we are here, um, we have triangle elongations. We can average those two if you want. I call Q minus just, just prior to the transition. And after that, we have Q plus after the transition. The triangles change their shape. The quadrilateral doesn't change the shape, but the triangles change their shape. And this shape change of triangles associated with the T1 transition, we have to take out of this equation. Because dQ dt counts this abrupt 
topologically induced triangle shape change in. And so we have to subtract it with this term R. So what it means, R has to be defined as the change in triangle elongation, which is discontinuous instantaneously at the time point Tn when this happens. And if we so add this correction term here, then we can still express V in terms of the QDT. Except that we had to take care there was this sudden re rearrangement which changed reference conditions and which meant that I, I don't have a smooth change of triangle uh, shape. So after this correction, and therefore the DQDT is sort of not the right measure because it, for V, because it contains abrupt changes. So deformations are smooth, but triangles behave discontinuously if there is a t topological change. And that's what this, correlation, this correction term captures. And it formally, if you do it exactly, you get, it, you get delta function contribution at each, at each um, moment in time when you have a remeshing. And if you now do averages over inter time intervals, which you have to do in experiment, like going from one frame to the next, you have to, to smoothen that. Then, then, then this sort of becomes smeared out in time. You take an, sort of a uh, coarse grained version of it. But this can be done on a computer simulation. This can be done exactly instantaneously. And now, by this method, one can now decompose this tissue shear in several different contributions, which are shown here as colored curves. And uh, I didn't show the extrusions here because in the wing, in the pupil wing, they are essentially zero. They don't, uh, you don't, it's boring to look at. But if we sum them all up, we get exactly the tissue shear. And, we, and the tissue shear can be calculated independently just by looking at how the boundary line of the tissue changes with time, as I mentioned at the beginning. And this is exactly the same thing. You know? So um, this, this we can we check, and it's surprising how well this works if you put these curves on top of each other. So here I have the overall tissue shear, the Q, which I described before. I also um, have not a pure contribution of only T1 transitions. I separate out a contribution coming from cell divisions because I can distinguish these events in my, in my database. I didn't plot extrusions, but I did. there's one um, contribution which I have to explain now, um, which we call a correlation contribution. Um, and that's a significant contribution in the pupil fly wing, which we found quite astonishing. Um, and as I'll show you in the next slide, it is related, it's a called, term called D, it is, has to do with coarse graining, because here I'm plotting curves not for um, individual triangles, but for an average over the whole blade. An average over the whole blade creates contributions that come from nonlinearities in the average. And if, in effect, the dominant contribution to this correlation term is, a, is an average of changes of cell shape correlated with local rotations. And this has a significant contribution. Now, where does this come from? Just to explain on this slide. So I showed you that for individual triangle, the mathematics gives us an exact, precise relation between the shear rate and the rate of change of Q, the triangle elongation tensor. I make the index n to, to, to identify this as an individual triangle property. Now we are looking at a larger tissue, a network. We average this quantity over the area in, with the area weight that I introduced before. And then we define a coarse-grained shear rate. And I told you also at the beginning that this is an exact way to calculate the coarse-grained shear rate. The definitions of my shear rate is as such that this average creates exactly the correct coarse-grained shear rate. And this is now exactly the same as an average of the QDT of triangles. <clears throat> now, the QDT, as I showed you, is a very complicated object. It is a time derivative that has to be taken in a co-rotating reference frame. And therefore, it is intrinsically nonlinear. It's not a linear operator, as usual derivatives are. It's a nonlinear object, which means that the time derivative of the average of Q is not the same as the average of the time derivative of Q. So in order to express this now in terms of my coarse-grained variables Q, which I want to use in a coarse-grained large-scale description, there's a correction. And this correction is nothing else than a difference between those two, the difference between dQ dt averaged or ddt of the average. And that's only due to correlations, due to, to the fluctuations. If the system, if all the triangles do the same thing in this tissue, 
then these two things are the same. It can only be different if there are inhomogeneities, if there's stochasticity, if different triangles are slightly different things. And then, if you now express this difference using the definition of this corrotational derivative, you get correlation functions appearing here. And in particular, what is important in this particular um, um, experiment is the correlation between local rotations and Q. And this comes because it's a corrotational term. The corrotational term multiplies a rotation rate with the Q itself, with this epsilon matrix to create a, create a rotation. It's a nonlinear term. And we can calculate this term, of course, from our data. And we need to calculate it to sum up all the contribution to tissue shear. So this contributes to tissue shear on, in this continuum coarse grain description. And we were wondering whether these correlations that contribute here, this, there must be a correlation between variables that has a significant contribution to overall tissue shear. We were wondering whether this corresponds to interesting processes that take place in this tissue. And I should also say, not all tissues do this. This is a property of the tissue that you have such correlations. And um, we're still not completely cl clear about what, 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 what this exactly comes from. But by looking, for example, at patterns of rotation. So here, I draw little red and blue circles on each triangle, where blue means clockwise rotation and red means counterclockwise rotation. And if you zoom into these things, you see they come sort of in lines. It has probably to do with the anisotropy that you see also in the cell elongations. Um, on average, there's no rotation. But there are local rotations, clockwise and counterclockwise, which come in lines. And these parallel lines, they actually correspond to situations where this correlation exists. So we think that these patterns of rotation together with cell shape um, that occur in the tissue generate effectively such a correlation, and this correlation has a consequence for the shear um, of the tissue, expressed in terms of coarse grain variables. OK, so that's um, about many details of how these cellular processes generate tissue deformations. In the remaining time, I now want to make use of this information to discuss the mechanics of this tissue. And I will, since we don't have enough information about the details of stresses of force generation in this tissue, I will take a very coarse grain point of view. So I will go move away from many of these details and just take averages over larger regions of the tissue. And I will also, in these averages, no longer really distinguish between these subtle dis uh, dif distinctions of contributions, such as um, shear due to cell division or shear due to T1 transitions. Anyways, the T1 transitions contribute dominantly to the shear due to cell rearrangements. And so I will just sum all these up, including the correlation term, into the quantity R. And from now on, on look at these free curves. But you should keep in mind that this red curve has all these interesting features in it and subtleties and, and, and distinctions of, of, of different types of cellular processes. Now let's move to the physics of this problem. So we, what I built so far was just building up tools to understand the geometry. All of these deformations, rearrangements um, that, I, that I discussed so far were essentially geometry, a little bit of topology. Um, these are just tools which allow me to define precise quantities and to allow, which I can measure and allow me also to understand how they are related. Now I use this. So I start from this information. And let me first discuss what happens at early times to give you an, a rough picture. Now, what happens at early times, I already mentioned it, a, a region of tissue is sheared and undergoes an elongation on the long axis. In this process, cells also change their shape and become more elongated on the long axis. That's why both the blue and the um, green curve go up, have a slope. However, the green curve goes up more steeply, and this corresponds to the red line having a negative slope. What this means is that somehow the T1 transitions contribute oppositely to shear than all the other things, which is a bit first, at first a bit surprising. But what it actually means is that T1 transitions change um, sort of bonds in a way that has to work against the externally driven shear. For example, it means that Negative slope here means that actually, while the tissue elongates along this axis and cells stretch, bonds parallel to this axis 
have a larger probability to actually shrink than perpendicular. And as these bonds shrink, they can drive T1 transitions after they open up perpendicularly, which now brings the cell two and four, which were apart, closer together. And you see in this effect, if both the tissue stretches and cells are pulled together by an active contraction is required here to, to, to generate this T1 transition, which corresponds to this negative slope, then the cells are stretched even more strongly than the tissue. Now, you see this, this cell stretches much more than a patch. Um, and that's what this red curve describes. Well, you see from this argument, because I have to evoke forces somehow to, to make this happen, that these T1 transitions have to work. They have to perform mechanical work. And they have to have some energy supply. This is an active process. This is not a passive process. So at the beginning, we see the tissue is stretched, not really from the outside, but with the help of hinge contraction. But for some reason, the cells are driven to stretch more by active T1 transitions. This is happening inside the tissue. The tissue drives this. So cells are stretched more than a tissue. And this happens up to this enormous cell shape change has been built up, more than a tissue shape change. And now we come to later times. So it's the second, second part. And in here now things are reverse signed. You see now the slope of the, of the red curve has changed sign. The T1s have changed their orientation. And at the same time, the cell shapes relax. What this means is again shown here. Now the T1 transition go the other way. Now, now the bonds contract perpendicularly and open here. And therefore, cells, while the whole tissue, the tissue patch elongates even more, there's still a continuous uh, shear going on. Um, the cells can now relax their shape because the cells that are hold together here are now can move apart and relax a little bit of this of the stress. And that's, that's why the elongation can go down here, while the tissue still continues to shear further. And that works together with this positive slope. Now, this process can be passive in principle. It can be active, but it can be passive because here now the T1 transitions follow sort of the stresses that are in the tissue. They don't work against these stresses in the tissue. They follow the stresses in the tissue. So now with this um, picture that I sort of give you to help understand what's going on, we can now build a model, a physical model of this process. And... Um, we have to take into account now the stresses in the tissue and the force balances in the tissue. And the basic idea is to consider cells themselves as elastic bodies. That's the easiest starting point. So I define the local stress, and this is only the shear stress. The tilde, in my case, are always the traceless symmetric parts of the tensor. The shear stress is proportional to the tensor Q, which defines the cell shape. That's just, that's, that's just an elastic description. Now, if, if you go from an isotropic to an elongated shape, you need to deform the object, and there is an elastic response. That's the elastic property. Now, in general, and because these are active systems, um, there can be also an extra contribution, which we call an active stress. So if, if cells generate internal stresses, they can deform spontaneously. That would be an interpretation of this, that stress is generated even if Q is zero. Alternatively, one can also think of the idea that a cell has sort of an intrinsic tendency to be elongated, and the stress is not zero when Q is zero, and this is sort of what, what counts for it. So there's an active and a passive version of the same equation, but since cells are always active systems, I will always consider this to be an active term. Now, this is a tensor, which is traceless symmetric, so it defines an axis, so one needs some sort of cell anisotropy to have this. But of course, the clear candidates are the PCP systems which I introduced yesterday. So cells are anisotropic, and so they can do this. So this is my equations describing stress, two dimensions. Then, of course, I will have to use my geometry, which I introduced to you in some length. I can define the shear rate of this tissue using the fact that there's a contribution from changes in cell shape, which then corresponds also to changes in stress. And shear due to cell rearrangements. Now, in principle, this I could do on a polygonal or a triangular model, in a, in a vertex model. But for simplicity, I will just take a coarse grain point of view and make a continuum model out of it, because we can solve it more easily. And also, since I missed the continuum theories in my first lecture, I can now bring one here in the third lecture. So from now on, I will think of these as continuum fields in the plane. This are also continuum variables in the plane. And then the only thing that is really difficult to do correctly 
because it's completely not understood and completely unknown, is to understand what equation to write for R. Because we, have, we need to have a constitutive material equation that tells us how R behaves, given the state of the tissue, in order to have equations that have a unique solution. And that's um, an equation for R. Now, in general, this is difficult to guess what it might be. R is a very complicated term because it involves um, the shear due to cell rearrangements. We don't really know when and how cell rearrangements actually happen. Probably stress plays a role in driving them, but active processes as well. So let's start in a simple-minded way. Let's not worry about non-linearities. Let's think in terms of a linear theory. But since cells are complex objects, things are slow, things take time, I will allow for memory effects. So it's not that things just are instantaneous. Cells can respond with some time because the internal processes, they take some time to respond. And there's one unique way to write a linear theory of memory, and that's written here. What it involves is, so the state is characterized by Q. Because it has a memory, it depends on a history of Q. And um, because linear, I can just superimpose it. And this defines a so-called memory kernel. That's a function chi that somehow captures all the complicated dynamics that goes in the cell and that determines how the history of what the cell experiences in terms of stress or, or shape changes now allows the, or the continuum, continuum of spirit, I shouldn't say, not, not a cell, but a patch of tissue. A patch of tissue um, with this history of Q and the complex process that take place in the tissue will give rise to a remodeling. And one goal will be to understand what this function chi looks like. Can we measure it? But writing this down, also I will also add the possibility that T1 transitions are actively driven. Of course, I saw in the data that this must be the case. So in addition to this part, I add a term which, similar to this term here, comes from active processes, requires some local chemical anisotropy, like a PCP system, to exist, will consume ATP to happen, and I can also add it to this. Now, this defines me a very simple model, which I can solve as a continuum model to, to discuss how this tissue remodels. The only thing that is missing to now solve this, to, to solve this is a force balance equation. Now, in continuum mechanics, force balance is equivalent to saying that the stress tensor is divergence-free. So the stress tensor is, has to do with momentum conservation. And momentum conservation involves divergence-free uh, stress. Now, the stress tensor has the shear part, sigma tilde. It also has the isotropic part, which in the case of stress in two dimensions, in three dimensions would be a pressure. In two dimensions, it's sort of an area type of pressure or some area tension. I still call it P. That's the isotropic part of the stress tensor. That is the um, traceless part of the stress tensor. In these systems, stress has no anti-symmetric terms and would be a separate lecture to discuss possible anti-symmetric parts of the stress, but which I will not use here. Now, what can we say about, so using this model now, what can we say about this big unknown, namely this memory kernel? To learn something about it, what, we, what, we, what we're doing is um, we make a plot of R versus Q taking our data, and then trying to analyze what, what is chi, whether a chi exists that describes this. R and Q we have measured. We know. So I can just, for example, plot Rxx versus Qxx for the whole blade. Each data point corresponds to the blade at a different time, and times are color-coded. So we are early here and late here. Another question is, can this equation account for this data? And it can. And it can, by the, the black curve is an example. So just fitting this equation to this data. And we get this black curve by using a very simple memory kernel, which is shown here. So the, usually the memory kernels can be, can be expressed as a superposition of many relaxation processes. In the simplest case, you can think of a model which has many relaxation processes that are exponential. And then you have to superimpose them. This defines this memory kernel. Here, we only need a single exponential to account for this data, which means there is a, some relaxation process that dominates um, this property to generate shear due to cell rearrangements. There is a single relaxation time, tau d, 
characterizing the, the relaxation. The prefactor of this kernel, you can look at, it, at units here, has a, a, is a square of time. So there are two time scales here. I can identify the tau d again. And the tau is a second time scale that is the classical Maxwell time. So if there was no memory, if the cell rearrangement would be instantaneous um, given a change in stress, um, this would generate what is called in, in, in uh, material science a Maxwell model, a viscoelastic material. And this is the Maxwell relaxation time. Now, this material is much more complex. It doesn't look like a Maxwell model. It's a generalization of it with more relaxation features. It has a second um, a time scale and a second relaxation process, which is characterized by this memory kernel. So we can measure all of this um, in the data. So we find that this um, relaxation time of this memory effect is four hours. Uh, this Maxwell relaxation time is two hours. We also, in this fit, get this constant, or this number lambda, which is, in fact, reflecting that T1 transitions must be partly active, at least in the early stages. And the fact that a sign is negative corresponds to that this red curve I showed you had a negative slope. So this must be an active uh, term um, driving this opposite direction. But because of the units of this equation, this lambda has units of time. So we have three time scales here in this, in this single uh, analysis. Now, um, what does this mean? Um, we can turn this knowledge into an understanding of the rheology of the material. Yeah, rheology is the science where you try to understand how a material responds when you expose it to stresses, or how the stress changes if you shear it. That's rheology. Yeah? And a simple example would be an elastic system which has an elastic stress if you deform it, but such materials are much more complex. They don't just respond elastically, they also show flow-like behavior and they have memory effects. And that's then characterized by rheology. Now to understand the rheology of this material, we can use this equation for the shear rate of the material, combine it with this equation for the shear due to cell rearrangements, eliminate from the discussion R, and only have a relationship between Q and V. And the relationship between Q and V is actually rheology, because Q is directly a proxy of the stress, because I use an elastic model for cell. So if the cell is elongated, there's elastic stress there. So Q is almost synonymous for stress, and V is the shear rate. So I can calculate V as a function of Q. That's the rheology. Now let's look at this model, which has quite surprising properties. I look at the situation where I, where I impose a step change in shear rate. So I start from the system with shear rate zero, and at a particular time, I suddenly begin to shear it at a constant rate. And that's this blue slope here. So I have zero shear rate, finite shear rate. And now I can calculate what is the response, the stress response of the system, or in my language here for today, it will be the cell elongation response of the system. And since it's linear, it's very straightforward to calculate this. There is an exponential response to a step change. The, there is a characteristic number s in the exponent. If you do the calculation, this s can become complex. So it has a real part, it has an imaginary part. It becomes complex exactly when this time tau d is bigger than the time tau, which it was in the experiment. This was four hours, this was two hours. Otherwise, it would be real, it would be simply relaxation. But because this is a complex number with an imaginary part, this exponential has not just a relaxation part, but it has also an oscillating part. And therefore, you get a damped oscillation. So the response of this tissue to a step change in shear is a damped oscillation response in this rheological model. And of course, this is reminiscent to what we see in a tissue. We have a shear which, which starts here, and we get a damped oscillation. At least we see one, one period of the oscillation in the data. However, an important difference between my very simple argument here and the, the, the tissue is that here the slopes are the same at the beginning. Because at early times, there's a purely elastic response in my, in my model. Um, and they're, they're parallel. And then when, when the cell rearrangements set in with some delay, then we have a difference of the two, two curves. However, I did not put in here the active T1 transitions. You know? So if I now add the active T1 transition to make them negative, then I do indeed generate this negative term. And then get qualitatively the, the, 
this type of behavior I see in the actual tissue. Even though this is a very crude situation where just you use a step change of shear rate. So what we see here is that this is, we have now material properties of this tissue. We have a model for its continuum mechanics. It has a very complex rheology. It has a surprising rheology, which I've never seen in any soft matter system, that if you put a change in shear rate, it has an oscillatory response. This, I think, requires an active system. You cannot get this in a passive material. And that's what, what the wing does. Now, in order to better understand what happens in... Yeah, Solving this equation, putting this number. This is a simple exercise. You can do it yourself. It's very easy. It's just a linear model. Um, um, so in order to discuss now the real tissue, and in order to get some sort of a quantitative comparison, we have to solve this continuum mechanical model in 2D, and we have to impose boundary conditions. Boundary conditions are completely, totally important for this. We cannot discuss this without boundary conditions. So what I want to do, the remaining couple of minutes, um, and that's what we did in order to analyze these experiments, is use a very coarse-grained simplified version of this model to be able to compare to experiments. We are lacking a lot of information of patterns, spatial patterns, um, of, of stress generation, of these, these active terms that I showed you in the tissue. So we know that a hinge and a blade behave completely differently, but we don't really know what are the differences within one of these tissues. So let's just average over the blade and over the hinge separately. Give the hinge and the blade different material properties. And we want to find out what material properties these are. We connect everything to an outer frame, which is rigid as the cuticle, with some elastic linkers. And there can also be some friction when the tissue moves relative to the cuticle. Um, and then we see whether such a model, by solving this, these, our equations now, for an homogeneous system with a rectangular shape for the hinge and the blade, whether we can account for the general features, the basic features of this wing. And the answer is we can. We can use that also to determine parameters for the blade and for the hinge. So the hinge we have next, I didn't discuss here, I didn't have the time, there's of course also a stress the equation describing the pressure in the tissue. Um, and then we have the shear. We had force balances, and to putting everything in, in, in the hinge, there's an active contraction that, 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 that we need to make it shrink. In that sense, the contractile part of the material has different properties in hinge and blade, and the other material properties can also be slightly different. And here you see now a comparison of the measured curves, um, cell elongation, tissue shear, and shear due to cell rearrangements, and, co and, and together with the solutions of our equations. Four parameters that have been chosen that this matches well. And we think this gives a very um, um, clear picture of the basic force balances and basic processes that take place. So here I just overlay our rectangle model to the video of the actual wing. Um, the rectangle model describes shape changes of these rectangles, which is essentially captures the, uh, the, the overall shear deformation of the whole tissue. It captures the shape changes of cells here, symbolized by a deformed hexagon. Um, it accounts for the correct um, shear due to cell rearrangements and cell flows. Um, and sort of it shows how the system can, by an interplay of boundary conditions, hinge, con hinge contraction, um, and active T1 transitions, undergo this morphogenetic change. Now, my time is essentially up, but I still want to briefly talk about the dumpy mutant, which was the whole teaser for the, for the whole talk, because now we have sort of an approach to study these shape changes. We have a basic idea of how this um, operates in the wild-type wing, and we can, of course, look at the, the same approach at mutants. And the dumpy mutant is particularly exciting, so let's look at this. So I mentioned as a mutant with a single um, gene mutation has a perturbation in the fly wing, we can watch this fly in the pupa. Here you see the wild type tissue in the pupa at early times. And here you see the mutant tissue at early times. And you cannot really distinguish the two, even though at the end they're very different. 
So up to the pupil stage, this dumpy mutant has not had, 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 did not have really dramatic problems. Uh, the problems arise now, exactly the time when we, when we can watch it. That's why it's so, so nice. And we can see what happens to this wing in the same 17 hours when we look at the wild type. And it behaves very differently. So the same system with just one gene mutation has a completely different dynamics. And the most striking difference is that the wing margin rapidly moves in. And um, this hints strongly at a change in boundary conditions. So this is a mechanical process, active forces generate inside, contractions, everything attached to a boundary. And if these boundary attachments are sort of altered, the whole process is dramatically changed. And that's what a dumpy mutant does. It controls boundary conditions. So dumpy is a protein that is part of the extracellular matrix that the tissue secretes. And that is the material that was asked before that is also linking the tissue to the cuticle. And probably dumpy provides such links, maybe between the tissue and the extracellular matrix. We don't know exactly what it links, but it is a key structural element that connects the tissue at the margin to the extracellular matrix. If one looks at in, in, in um, YFP distribution, one finds it along the whole margin, one finds it also on the surface of the tissue. So it also contributes to friction between the tissue and the cuticle and the plane, which you also need to understand uh, this mechanics as a parameter, which is a friction coefficient. And if you look at dumpy mutant, um, you see that somehow it can detach from the margin, it's sort of reminiscent of what happened when we did the la laser ablation. And um, from that, we, we propose that what a dumpy mutant actually does, or the, the effect it has, is if it's mutated, it changes the connections, the mechanical connections of the boundary, and therefore it changes the mechanical boundary conditions for this very complex active process that I described. So to apply our approach, the idea then is to say, we would expect that the material properties of the tissue, of the cells themselves, are unchanged. The dumpy some are outside. So we keep the same parameters that we determined for the wild type, for all the tissue parameters, but we allow now all the parameters that describe um, the effects of linkers to the outside to change. Um, the stiffness of these springs and also the friction coefficients when the system slides. And um, essentially we change that in the blade region, but if we, we also change values in the, in, the, in the hinge region. And this is enough to sort of quite nicely account for the dumpy data. Um, and we can do a, sort of the same comparison experiment theory that I did for the, for the wild type. OK, maybe sort of to finish, I guess my time is up. Although do we have still have some time? Probably not. Yeah. So since we want to go for lunch, let's maybe have one more slide. <laughs> because the whole thing which I explained to you about shear and shear deformations, one can, of course, also do for the isotropic part of the deformation and the um, it's much easier. I didn't show it because it's sort of more simple, but it's also interesting to see. And that is sort of the tissue area dynamics. So we can also, and it's exactly the same idea, it's just easier to do than for shear, we can decompose area changes. You can do that either for single cells or for patches of tissue. Um, so he has written for a patch of tissue. Um, the rate of change of tissue area can be decomposed in the contribution that comes simply from the fact that cells grow or shrink in the area, but there are corrections coming from cell divisions and cell extrusions. And so we can do the same type of decomposition of areas as we do for shear. And here we shall show you what happens in the wild type. The blue curve is the area change. You see here the wing blade almost doesn't change its area. Even though there are lots of cell divisions, um, cells become smaller, the area, it, it oscillates a little bit. And this, in fact, this is the same oscillation that I showed you before, which comes from this complex rheology. So there are stresses and there are pressure changes, and it changes a little bit the area, but it's, there's almost no area change. Then there are contributions. This blue curve can be decomposed in three contributions. Cell divisions, cell area change, and extrusions. Yeah? And so if there are no extrusions, and if, there's, if divisions perfectly subdivide the tissue, then each division halves the size, the area of cells, and then this orange curve and this green curve exactly cancel. So this comes from, this is negative because cells get smaller, this is positive because cells divide. So if you have division and cells 
keep the area, then the area would grow according to the orange curve. If cells get smaller at the same time, this compensates. And extrusions also tend to make it smaller. And here you see the dumpy. There are many more extrusions in dumpy. And dumpy, the area actually shrinks. And this has to do that with the fact that extrusions are stress dependent. And this is a subject which I cannot go into today because time is up. And um, I'd like to finish here. I'd like to thank you for your attention and for your patience being a bit over time today. <laughs>